We are back and we are joined now by Seth Harp, investigative reporter and contributing editor at Rolling Stone, whose piece on Fort Bragg is like really just a must read um, for everybody. Seth, uh, thanks so much for being here today. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. So you begin your piece kind of setting the scene uh, of two men who were killed by gunshots outside of Fort Bragg. Um, And I mean, the numbers are just startling in terms of how many deaths have piled up in the since the beginning of 2020. What led you to to looking into this and uh, what I guess take us to the beginning of your piece where you initially set that scene? Yeah, it was that double murder that you just referred to that initially brought me to uh, this the story of Fort Bragg, the larger story of Fort Bragg, um, the murder of Billy Levine and Timothy Dumas. That actually happened in December 2020. Um, last time I came on y'all's show, I talked a bit about that um, and some other murders that seem to be linked to drug trafficking by elite soldiers at Fort Bragg. Um, and at that time, I mentioned that... Um, there have been a large number of deaths of Fort Bragg soldiers in general. So aside from the murders, there have been at least 44 deaths at Fort Bragg uh, among soldiers that year in 2020. Um, And I told you all about how I was trying to figure out exactly what uh, was going on there, what was behind such a high body count. Now, come to find out here almost uh, a full year later with the latest piece, the total number of soldiers that have died at Fort Bragg over two year time period from 2020 to 2021 was 109 uh, and 105 of those occurred um, stateside, uh, whereas only four of them took place in overseas combat operations. And the latest piece I wrote for Rolling Stone really focuses on um, one of the major leading causes of death there, which is uh, accidental drug overdoses, which is pretty obviously linked to the, you know, the, the prior topic, which is, um, you know, a lot of the drug crime that was going on in Fort Bragg. So, so uh, set the stage too for just uh, what Fort Bragg is um, for our audience in terms of like its role uh, in some of the special ops uh, bureaucracy and uh, just how essentially um, it's there's a lot of like elite uh, military training that happens there. And with that comes a ton of secrecy, which I'm sure was a major obstacle in your reporting on this. Um, wh- so f- for our audience, what is Fort Bragg and, and what goes on there in terms of training? Yeah, totally. I described it in the piece as uh, the beating heart of the U.S. global special operations complex. Fort Bragg is not just any army base. Uh, it's the army's most important installation, probably the most important military installation in the United States. Um, it's the home of the Airborne Corps, um, the Green Berets, Special Forces, um, and also JSOC, the Joint Special Operations Command, um, which is a covert military within the military that since 9-11 has become by far the most powerful combatant command in the entire Pentagon, it has um, enormous autonomy, autonomy and global reach and power. It's based there at Fort Bragg. That's where its headquarters is, is a compound within the compound there. And I'm not sure that most um, people who are unfamiliar with these issues are really aware of the transformation of the military over the last 20 years, over this component of the military into something more like an intelligence agency than um, what we would think of as a traditional Army Special Forces unit that really is just, you know, hitters that follow orders that go out and, um, you know, kick down doors and raid compounds. That JSOC does a lot more than that. Uh, I was just um, talking to a source yesterday who was a civilian employee for Delta Force, which is the Army component of JSOC. She was talking about her job was to create cover identities for operators in Delta Force. So she would make, um, you know, fake license uh, plates, fake driver's licenses, and get fake passports. From them. Of course, not fake, they're all real. They're actually issued by these agencies, uh, by these um, offices of the United States uh, or states. Uh, so they're official documents, but they, um, you know, it's, they're fictitious. And they would use these documents to do missions um, that are uh, totally covert. So you're not talking about guys wearing uniforms and carrying guns. This person that I spoke to yesterday mentioned uh, operations in China and in Israel uh, in particular. So that's just to name two examples of countries where you have undercover active duty U.S. military members going and doing intelligence collections operations 
uh, covertly without the knowledge uh, of, country, of those countries, China or Israel, uh, and of course without the knowledge of the U.S. public. So that's the kind of thing that goes on in Fort Bragg, which makes uh, you know the endemic drug crime there all the, all the more alarming, I think. And also just lacking in terms of any uh, oversight, not just from the you know the outside from reporting, but the the budget is classified, which I was not aware of. Um, and uh, the it's expensive to train these uh, officers there and these soldiers there. And yet there's quite um, very little sunlight on what happens. And so it, I mean, it makes the, the deaths and the clear homicides uh, Im- impossible to really kind of uh, get to the bottom of, but also this burgeoning drug crime that you've done reporting on. Yeah, we American citizens not authorized to know how much uh, JSOC cost us, also not authorized to know what countries JSOC is um, operating in whether they're doing covert wars in countries like the Philippines or Mali or Somalia, Yemen, we're not authorized to know any, anything about that. So, so don't ask, that's the US government position. Um, and if that's news to you, you should probably get in a time machine and go back to about 2001, um, cause this has been going on for all of these years, um, kind of underneath the radar. Yeah, I mean, honestly, when you think about like post 9-11 special ops, the, it probably all originates or m- much of it originates from here. Um, so I, I want to get into the drug overdose piece, but just to set the stage a little bit more for uh, why, you know, you're, there were so many deaths, uh, y- your initial reporting on this spoke about not just homicides or killings, beheadings that were kind of swept under the rug. But this was all within the context of a large uh, drug usage kind of ring, trafficking ring that was already in in existence. And there was a lot of uh, intense drug use, wide drug use uh, uh, under uh, a lot of secrecy at Fort Bragg. So uh, so talk about that. Yeah, all of those things, you know, to be clear, I'm not alleging like a dark alliance type thing where the U.S. Army Special Forces is trafficking cocaine from Colombia or wherever to the United States. I don't think that's happening. I don't see why that would be happening um, because they have all the money that they could possibly want. So why would they need to engage in that kind of thing? Um, But I do think that it's more and more the kind of thing that um, various Green Berets, also Navy SEALs, have been getting into more and more over the past five years or so. I said, I think it's really not my opinion. There's been uh, at least a half dozen cases of current or former Green Berets or Navy SEALs who have not just been uh, uh, charged with, but actually either convicted or pleaded guilty to heavy duty trafficking charges uh, since about 2015. Um, And there are cases where they never got to anywhere near a courtroom, like the case of Billy Levine, who was found uh, shot to death outside of Fort Bragg. Also, Timothy Dumas will never figure out exactly what they were up to. The other beheading case you mentioned of Enrique Roman Martinez, I recently uh, acquired CID's investigative file into that, uh, which makes it clear as my initial reporting suggested or strongly implied, whatever happened, it had something to do with those soldiers, um, distribution of LSD on Fort Bragg, some kind of dispute over um, their LSD distribution activities there. So this kind of thing really pervades Fort Bragg by the basis own admission drug crime was up 100% in 2021 or 2020. And to me, it's very uh, indicative of kind of institutional breakdown, uh, breakdown in, in good order and discipline at Fort Bragg. Um, after 20 years of forever war in which the Fort, it's the Fort Bragg units have been the ones that have been deployed over and over to Afghanistan, over and over to Iraq. Um, it's, at one, it's always the 82nd Airborne the president uh, goes to, if not you know the fifth group or the seventh group or JSOC. It's, it's one of these um, formations inevitably. Most recently, the evacuation of the Kabul airport was, uh, was done by the 82nd. Last soldier to die in Afghanistan was a member of the 82nd. Um, and once again, they were deployed when the, the war in Ukraine started to backstop, uh, NATO forces over there in Poland, 5,000 Fort Bragg soldiers from the 82nd went over there. That's all to say nothing of what the Green Berets continue to do in countries like Iraq, Syria. Um, and, and of course what JSOC is doing, which we're, we we do not get to know cause it's all, uh, classified. So I see it all as part of the same, uh, phenomenon, uh, drugs allow soldiers and operators to work longer hours, 
uh, with less uh, sleep, with less food. It's also very, um, you know, people turn to drug, people who have been traumatized, whether it's from killing other human beings or seeing people killed, um, often will turn to drugs to, to mediate the intent, to medicate the self-medicate, auto-medicate the intense anxiety uh, and depression that is associated with PTSD. Um, so it's all part of the same um, really ugly and unfortunate uh, picture in, in my view. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the the cycle of trauma. And um, the the reality is, is that if there is more sunlight on um, what's happening at Fort Bragg or what that money is going towards, uh, then there's going to be larger understanding that, like, actually, we are inflicting immense trauma on our own soldiers through these forever wars and through these programs that I mean, the, the numbers are staggering in terms of these fentanyl overdoses and deaths as a result of drugs. Um, just talk about the people that you spoke with and what they've said about how their family and friends have turned to drugs just to to deal with the trauma that they've endured over the past, I don't know, how many decades of service? Two decades. Well, it's worth splitting up, you know, two groups of types of soldiers uh, in this context. Um, and the first is kind of what we're talking about before guys in their thirties or even their forties who are operators who are, who are, or who are green berets who have done many deployments, sometimes over a dozen deployments. A lot of those guys also use drugs, not just for mediating trauma, but because in the army, because so many resources and uh, privileges uh, have been heaped on the special forces over the, and special operations over the last uh, few decades that, you know, they kind of live like rock star, star lifestyles in places like Fayetteville, which is the big military town right by Fort Bragg. Um, there's a ton of partying going on. Soldiers like to drink. That's that's not uh, that's hardly groundbreaking news. But um, the use of cocaine, in particular, as just uh, as like a, as a party drug or something that folks take when they're drinking, that's really on the rise in special operations and kind of uh, low key that most uh, folks are not culturally attuned to. But um, it's also the same thing in the Navy SEALs. Lots of reports over the last few years of SEALs doing hard drugs. Uh, and not just, you know, we're not talking about guys drinking beer and smoking weed. We're talking about heroin, uh, crack cocaine, MDMA, those kind of things, using on a regular basis. Um, so that's one, that's one component of it. And another uh, component of it that I reported on is, is, is a bit different. We're talking about um, the 82nd Airborne, which is conventional army, although it's airborne, it's conventional army. So you have a, a lot of young soldiers who are 18, 19, 20 years old. And what I reported on going on with that population is a lot of fentanyl overdoses. Um, and to answer your question, you know, I've interviewed family members of soldiers who have died at Fort Bragg from fentanyl overdoses. Many of them say that their son, it's usually their son, in some cases their brother, um, what, had no history of drug use at all. Um, and uh, was dead within a year of being stationed at Fort Bragg. So some questions when I hear cases like that, which include, by the way, talking about the case of Matthew Disney, talking about the case of Joshua Diamond, uh, Zachary Bracken, just to name a few of, of, of uh, young soldiers who have died um, and whose families have interviewed. Um, and they say that, you know, that, that none, of those, uh, none of those men had any history of drug use before they got to Fort Bragg. So what I like to know is one, where did they get uh, the fentanyl that killed them? You know, did they get it from another soldier? Uh, and also, you know, w was this something that they were take doing before they got to Fort Bragg? Because, you know, or was it something that developed afterwards? Because uh, they're literally in the custody of the U.S. government and were owed an an some kind of answer when, when people who are active duty soldiers die. Um, and so far, we haven't gotten anything remotely like uh, some kind of answer, even a response from the Army. What's the relationship between local law enforcement in Fayetteville uh, and uh, what, how their ability to investigate any of the potential crimes coming out of Fort Bragg, which is like in their backyard, but I imagine they get bigfooted quite a lot. Uh, yeah, I mean, I. <laughs> what's the role of local law enforcement there um, to cover up crimes? I don't know. They they don't solve a lot of them. That's for sure. Um, I don't want to paint with too broad of a brush. Sometimes they carry out busts. They busted a master sergeant in the 82nd um, named Martin Acevedo III, heavy duty cocaine trafficking charges, caught him with a bunch of firearms, coke, and cash at his house. So you do see busts like that. 
However, in a lot of other cases, it's very clear that, especially when the soldier concerned is the member of an elite unit and they could potentially embarrass um, an organization like JSOC or the First Special Forces Command, those charges just disappear. I mean, you don't see in Cumberland County, Hope County, all the other counties around Fort Bragg, you will not see a Delta Force operator come up on charges. It doesn't matter what he did. It doesn't matter if he rammed his car while he was driving drunk into a bunch of teenagers and fled on foot like a Delta operator named Lee Ampola did earlier this year. Those charges don't know what happened to those. All this is allegedly, by the way, because it's just an arrest report that I'm going off of. Um, but those charges just went away. You know, Billy Levine committed a string of crimes around, um, or uh, allegedly committed a string of crimes around Fayetteville. Five separate felonies he was arrested for, uh, including aggravated assault with a deadly weapon and murder, first degree murder, he was arrested for that. All those charges disappear. Uh, Cristobal Lopez Vallejo, arrested for second degree rape. He's another Delta operator. All these guys I mentioned are Delta operators. Once again, those charges uh, ultimately disappeared from the Cumberland County criminal docket. So I don't think you can ever see a case where you're going to find some a man who served in Delta Force as an operator uh, ends up um, in a courtroom and being actually prosecuted. I've never seen a case like that. I mean, did they not collect any evidence um, at the in some of these cases? It seems like so clear. Right. And your piece from 2021, this was a homicide. <laughs> and yet the, the the it seems like there was not any testimony taken, um, any uh, physical evidence collected. I mean, how is that even possible? <laughs> I don't know what the tenor of the conversations were that took place behind closed doors, but I don't think you would see the same thing if it was just a regular Joe who had who was who was drunk uh, and high, uh, you know, out of his mind on uh, four different uh, substances, shoots and kills a guy, his best friend, for no apparent reason, with his personal firearm. Uh, comes up with this cock and mamie story about how his buddy came at him with a screwdriver and he had to do it with self-defense. And that's all you, that, that was good enough for the detectives in Cumberland County. That was good enough for Billy West, who's the DA of Cumberland County. Charges were dismissed that same night. Billy Levine was never even drug tested. Um, and as the sister of that victim in that uh, homicide told me, if they had done a proper investigation, all the bodies and drugs that were associated with uh, with Levine uh, could have been avoided. It, it just really is it just jarring. And um, to zoom out a little bit, the the these stories that come out of Fort Bragg really do seem to um, be. It's almost our war on terror in a nutshell, right? Where a complete lack of oversight for uh, special operations, funding that is endless and seems to just like be unencumbered by any stories of brutality or murder or cruelty that come out of these places. And yet, you know, it seems that the president has the authority if he wanted to, if this reporting was more highlighted, to, to alter that. But like once these systems of of uh, shadowy power are created, it's like they just, they, they, they're unencumbered and it's really difficult for there to be any outside pressure to end them because they, they become organisms onto themselves. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's not clear who's exercising oversight over JSOC now. I mean, when it first was exponentially increased to, um, and to have enormous power and funding and global reach under the Bush administration, and then later even to an even greater extent under the Obama administration, I think they were actively utilizing the unit um, in all kinds of different ways and were knew more or less what kind of operations were going on. Um, but they cut the regular military chain of uh, chain of command out of the well. They cut the rel uh, regular Joint Chiefs of Staff and Secretary of Defense out of the chain of command. So JSOC effectively answers directly to the president, uh, and that's constitutionally problematic um, in a lot of ways. That ship, of course, has sailed. Uh, we just live in a country now where the where the president has his own personal uh, covert military to call on. Um, but to what extent the Biden administration is actually exercising oversight over JSOC, that's a good question. I don't really have any insight into that. Honestly, to me, they seem pretty checked out. Um, and who knows what's going on behind the scenes? What, 
I know and what I report on is weird stuff that happens around Fort Bragg where it's never fully explained. Um, the budget seems highly suggestive and, and suspicious, for lack of a better word. I mean, just less than a month ago, or perhaps a month ago, um, a contract pilot for Delta Force named Charles Crooks fell out of a plane uh, into someone's suburban backyard in Fayetteville. Just a dead body fell out, of, or a, a, a man's body fell out of the sky, hit their backyard, and he died. Um, now he was a contract pilot, a civilian contract pilot for USAFOC, which is the U.S. Army Special Operations Command, probably for Delta Force. Um, and there's no clear explanation of how he fell or jumped is the tech, is the language that I, that you'll see in the reporting around this at all. Um, and the the official story or the the story that authorities seem to be going with, at least initially, is that he mid-flight um, became upset over something, needed felt sick, and needed some fresh air. Like, to, to, and to me, that is not a very satisfactory explanation at all. Um, no. And you know, just a few years before this, another uh, Delta Force contract pilot, a man named Tim Thacker. Uh, was arrested and sentenced to 40 years in prison for trafficking methamphetamine in North Carolina. The Justice Department describes him as a major uh, methamphetamine kingpin, which is a statutory designation uh, that they applied to Tim Thacker and gave him 40 years in, in federal prison. And he was a lifelong contract pilot for Delta Force who was well uh, enmeshed in the unit, um, who grew up in the unit because his father was a legendary Green Beret named Gene Thacker who himself was accused of cocaine trafficking back in the 1980s, uh, but was acquitted when all of his teammates um, took the stand and uh, testified to the uprightness of his character. So these are things, these threads you can trace uh, back many years in terms of like lawlessness and drug trafficking in the Green Berets. But we've certainly seen an acceleration in what I would describe as, um, you know, a lot of smoke around this. So you, it's, it's hard to find the actual fire itself because it's very difficult to get um, solid um, factual reporting on these units because they don't talk to the press. Uh, Army has no comment. JSOC has no comment. Um, the, and the police do nothing to investigate these cases. They just swoop in, seize the evidence, tell everyone they're investigating, and you never hear another word breathed about the case ever again. And lastly, I mean, another another big picture theme here is not just like the failure and um, the it, the immense cloud of sadness and and uh that that the war on terror has created and the trauma that it inflicts on people um through others uh it, it is it's generational trauma this is also just the failure of the war on drugs um that this uh, exemplifies and how essentially just because of this lack of oversight uh, these things have been able to run rampant and I would imagine that and you can just confirm or deny this that people in Fayetteville and the surrounding areas and law enforcement are aware of the integration between some of these folks and the drug trafficking uh, rings but that it, it it's almost just like it's good business to a degree to let it slide Yes, I couldn't agree with more. Uh, couldn't agree more with what you just said. Um, I always tell folks that the war in Mexico ought to be lumped in the same sentence with the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, because it started right around the same time. So, well, to take it back even one step before that, there was a sort of brief window in the 1990s when the U.S. Uh, military uh, and the federal government were kind of uh, adrift because they really need an external enemy. Uh, to oppose. That's the way that our government uh, kind of functions. Everything is always directed towards the latest foreign boogeyman du jour, where everything is geared around opposing that. Some kind of war paradigm we need in order to function in our political economy. Uh, and after the Cold War, when Russia was no longer available to serve that role, there was a time when they tried to do like the war on drugs was going to be the big national security paradigm around which everything else was organized. Now, that didn't really work very well. It didn't, it didn't really test well with market audiences, so to speak. Like, it just wasn't a great uh, paradigm. They quickly found a much, much better one in the, in the war on terror after 2001. But the war on drugs continued apace. It never, it wasn't as if they stopped doing that. 
And where it really um, accelerated was in Mexico around 2005, 2000, let's say 2005, 2010, within that window. Uh, but certainly starting with the Merida Initiative in 2008, which George W. Bush pressured, uh, the George W. Bush administration pressured the government of Mexico to fully militarize its conflict against the cartels and to fight uh, drug trafficking cartels with overt military force. Um, right around the same time, they were ramping up the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. That's why I say they ought to be considered together, even though, of course, this uh, conflict in Mexico was fought uh, with Mexican troops rather than with uh, uh, American troops. And the result, like in Iraq, like in Afghanistan, the deaths of hundreds of thousands of innocent people while accomplishing zero of the United States' uh, stated objectives in those conflicts. Um, so what we're seeing at Fort Bragg now, I think, can be understood as a kind of collapse and failure, not just of the, of the terror wars, not just of the post-9-11 wars, but also the war on drugs and all collapsing back and blowing back stateside in that community in Fayetteville, um, which is both steeped in trauma and insulated from accountability. Well, uh, Seth Harp, investigative reporter and contributing editor at Rolling Stone. You can read uh, his both of his pieces, but the more recent one uh, from this month is entitled These Kids Are Dying Inside the Overdose Crisis Sweeping Fort Bragg. Uh, Seth, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Great to be here.